Hi, I'm Adam. Welcome back to Godot Game Lab. In this video, we'll add two new components to the units, the velocity-based rotation and the outline highlighter. So if I hover over a unit now, you can see that this white outline appears. And if I move the mouse away, then this outline disappears, right? If I click and drag the unit, you can also see that if I drag the unit fast enough, we have this smooth rotation, which makes placing the units around the map much more satisfying. Also, I can hover the unit over other units and they will be highlighted as well. And another final thing I can do is I start dragging the unit and cancel it with the right click. You can see that the unit snaps back to its starting position and the outline highlight disappears. Let's jump into architecture first. So in the last episode, we implemented the unit, the unit stats and the drag and drop component. However, we still need to do the velocity based rotation and the outline highlighter components. So that's what we'll focus on in this video. So the velocity based rotation component works like this. We calculate the velocity of the moving unit every frame. If this velocity is above a certain threshold, we smoothly rotate the unit to a certain extent. Again, this is a highly configurable component. We can configure the target of this rotation, the rotation value, the threshold of the velocity we need to reach in order to start the rotation. And we'll also use a lerp or linear interpolation to make the rotation smooth and that will be configurable as well. The other component we have is called outline highlighter. It highlights the outline of a given 2D object on demand. So to achieve this, we'll use a shader from godoshaders.com and again this is a configurable component to make it reusable later on we can set the target the outline thickness and the color of the outline we want so let's get straight into it so i have my project open here and before we jump into implementing the new components we have two small issues to fix pointed out by you guys in the comments the first issue is related to dragging so if i run the game now it can sometimes happen if i release the mouse fast enough that even though I'm not pressing or holding left mouse button now, I still drag the unit, right? It's kind of hard to get this bug, but sometimes it can happen. If you release the mouse fast enough, I did it again, and then let go, you can still be stuck in the dragging position. So why is that? Actually, this viewer who commented also proposed the solution and it's exactly what's going on here. So if we go into the drag and drop component we scripted in the last episode, you can see that we have all this logic here. We have three really important pieces of code here. One is related to canceling the dragging, one is to starting the dragging process, and one is to dropping the unit. See, the problem is this is a callback function and it's only executed when the area 2D node registers the input event. What does that mean? It means that when we want to cancel dragging or when we want to drop the unit, we actually have to have the mouse over the unit itself, right? And that's the case like 99% of the time, but it can happen if you move the mouse fast enough that the unit is still lagging behind and you let go of the mouse and the mouse is outside the unit on that specific frame. So fixing this is pretty straightforward. All we have to do inside the drag and drop component is actually moving, canceling and dropping the unit to a different part of the code, right? Because yes, it's true that we only want to start dragging a unit when the mouse input event is registered on top of the unit. But actually for canceling or dropping the unit, that's not strictly needed. So one quick fix is to actually grab these two statements right here and move them to the input callback instead of this area to the callback. So if we scroll all the way up, we have the ready and process virtual methods and we can actually take the input virtual method as well and move those two lines of code here. So if we go down, we can cancel the dragging, first of all, inside our input callback, like so, and kind of do the same for dropping the unit as well. Again, we can go back here and just paste these line of code like so. So this essentially solves this little bug. 
And if we go down, now we have a problem because we have an elif here, which is not needed because we don't have an if connected to this. This can just become an if instead of an elif, because again, we want to start the dragging process when the mouse event is registered on that area 2D. But for letting go or dropping the unit, that's not strictly needed. So if we save this script and run the game again, now I shouldn't be able to do the thing I did before, where if I let go real quick, the unit is still inside the dragging process. I can no longer cheat that system if I move fast enough. And while we're here, I can show you the other problem we have. So if you take a look at this dude here, it looks like he <laughs> opened his eyes real wide, right? So we have a problem here. And the pixel art looks a bit messy. You can take a look at his club, right? It doesn't look right. And also his eyes doesn't look right either. So some of you spotted that sometimes it can happen that this dude looks like this if we drag it around. And the reason is pretty simple. We use pixel art for this game, right? And we only want to move units integer values. See, the problem is when we drag the unit around, we can have fraction coordinates, right? So it can happen that instead of this being 0 and 0, I can move it something like 100.5, right? And these transforms, these fraction values in the transforms can mess up the rendering for pixel art. And that's not at all what we want. But luckily for us, that's a pretty easy fix. It's just a checkbox in the project settings. So let's go to project, project settings, and let's search for render. And under rendering, we have 2D. So if we go to rendering in 2D, we have a bunch of options here. And what we want is this, snap 2D transforms to pixel. And if we hover over it, you can see the description. If true, canvas item nodes will internally snap to full pixels. Useful for low-res pixel art games. Right, the position can still be sub-pixel, but the decimals will not have an effect as the position is rounded. This can lead to a crisper appearance. Absolutely what we want, right? So if we enable this and close the project settings, save the whole thing with Control S and run the game again, I can no longer find these fraction positions where the unit opens his eyes and the pixel art gets messed up. No matter how small movements I make, I can't seem to find a transform which messes up the appearance of the unit, right? They look identical. So thanks for pointing these out and I'm glad we were able to fix those before jumping into implementing new things. If you like my content, please consider checking out my Ko-fi page where you can donate one time or become a member and get early access to all my content and videos. Now onto the new components. So the first thing we want to do is to open up the unit scene and we want to use our velocity based rotation component here, but first we have to actually create the component. So let's go to our file system doc, select the components folder, right click, create a new script, and let's call this velocity based rotation.gd. And we can just turn off the template by unchecking this and create a new script and double click to open it up in the code editor. So the first thing we do in this component is providing a custom class name called Velocity Based Rotation. Then we have a bunch of export variables. The first one will be a boolean value used to enable and disable this component. By default we enable it, so we set it to true. And we'll also provide a custom setter function called set enabled. So when we disable this component, we can reset the rotation of the target to zero. Then we have a node 2D called target, which is the target node we actually want to rotate, right? This will be the unit itself, or rather the image or the graphic of the unit. Then we have a variable, which is a float called lerp seconds. And I use the export range here to provide a reasonable range of values between 0.25 and 1.5 seconds. So we want to rotate the unit smoothly instead of setting the rotation from 0 to 90 degrees, let's say instantly, right? We don't want this to happen instantly, so instead we want to interpolate it. So this is the amount of time it takes to get from 0 to 90 degrees, for example. Then we have a rotation multiplier, which will be basically the amount we want to rotate, and you can experiment with this value. And then we have the last one, which is called X velocity threshold. And this will be the minimum velocity for the unit to reach 
to actually start rotating. And this will be useful because we don't really want the unit to start rotating like crazy even with the slightest movements, right? So we have this threshold saying that, okay, if you reach this velocity, then you can start rotating. Then we also need a couple other member variables to keep track of. First of all, we have a vector 2 for the last position. And the last position here means the position of the unit in the last frame. So we use the current frame's position and the last frame's position to determine the velocity of the unit. Then we have another vector 2 for the velocity, a float for the current angle, a float for the progress we made. And this progress is a value between 0 and 1, which is basically a percentage, right? So we want this amount of time, this lerp seconds, to be 100% and we want 0 seconds to be 0%. So we can say that if 0 0.2 seconds elapsed, it means that we are at 50% progress, right? Because it's half the time it takes to reach the end rotation. So the progress will be a percentage keeping track of where we're currently at, and the time elapsed will be the variable which keeps track of how much time passed since we started the rotation. All the magic will happen inside the process virtual method, so we want to run this code every frame. And first of all, we'll provide a safety check. So if the target is not given, or this component is disabled, then we can return from the function immediately because we don't really want to do anything. Otherwise, first of all, we can calculate the velocity for this frame. We take the target's global position and subtract the last position from the last frame. Then after that, we can set the last position for future reference based on the target's global position in this frame. After we have the velocity, we can also calculate the progress we made, right? So we can take the time elapsed and divide it by lerp seconds. So basically, if 0.4 seconds elapsed, then 0.4 divided by 0.4 will be 1.0, meaning 100%, right? So this easy division provides us with the progress we want to make. And then here's the interesting part. So first of all, we'll look at the velocity's x component and take the absolute value of it. Why do we need the absolute value? Well, because if I start moving the unit from the right to the left, that velocity will be negative, right? Because if you remember on the horizontal axis, values decrease from the right to the left. And this means that the velocity's x component will be negative. But we still want to check if it's above the velocity threshold. So what we do is we take the absolute value to make sure that this is positive. And then we can compare it to the threshold. And if we're above the threshold, then the target angle will be based on that velocity. So what we do is we take the velocity vector's x component and we normalize it. And what does this do? So normalizing a vector means that both the x and the y value will be between 0 and 1. So we want to take the x velocity, normalize it, and multiply it with our rotation multiplier and also delta time to make this frame rate independent. So this will give us the angle that we currently want, right? Otherwise, if we don't reach that threshold, it means that the angle, the target angle for this frame will be 0.0, .0 because we slowed down or the unit isn't moving. So either way, we want to slowly, smoothly rotate back to zero. Again, this is just the target angle. We just set a member variable here. The next thing is where actually the rotation happens. So we set the target member variables rotation property and we call this lerp angle method. We take the target's current rotation, the target angle we want to reach, and that progress member variable, which will be a value between 0 and 1. And after the lerping, we just need to add to the time elapsed this delta time, right? Because delta will be the time between the last two frames, right? This frame and the previous one. So it will be, if we run the game at 60 FPS, it will be something like 0 0.0016 or something like that. So it's a really small number, but it's basically the time elapsed between the two frames. So we add this to the time elapsed. And the one final thing we need to do is to check if the progress is above 1.0, because that means that we definitely reached the target 0.4 seconds, right? If we divided the time elapsed and the lerp seconds, let's say this is um, 0.5. So 0.5 divided by 0.4 is bigger than one. And this means that we need to reset the whole thing, right? So we just set the time elapsed to 0.0, so we can restart the whole process over again. Okay, so before doing the setter function, because we still need that setter function, 
how does this lerp thing work? I don't really want to go into details about this because there are a lot of great resources. So first of all, let me show you the documentation page. So we have an interpolation page in the Godot documentation where you get this simple explanation what interpolation is, how it's calculated, how it can be used for vectors and a couple of GIFs. And this is a really useful one, right? It's for position, not rotation, but the idea is the same. So we want to take this ball from A to B, right? Smoothly. So when we learn the position, we have this T value, which we call progress, right? And this is a value, as you can see, a value between zero and one. So it's kind of like a percentage. So we have A and B. A is the starting position and B is the target position. So 0.0, .0 means that the ball is at A and 1.0 means that the target arrived at the destination, right? And anything in between will be sort of like a progress bar, right? So we can use this for position, we can use this for rotations, you have a bunch of examples here. We can even use it for transforms in 3D objects. You get this smooth sort of fade between the two. You can see following the mouse here. So if you want to read more, I'll leave the link to this doc page down in the description. Also, if you want to dig deeper into linear interpolation, I have a really, really good video for you. It's an hour long and there's a lot of math involved, but especially the introduction part is really, really well explained and it has great visuals to make it more easy to digest. So it's far better explained than I could ever explain to you. So if you have the time or interested in linear interpolation, please watch this video. Okay, but back to the code, that's all we need from this part and we still lack for this enabled property, we have an error message that said enabled is not found. So we still need to provide that setter function and it will be pretty easy. So basically we set the enabled property to the value we have as a parameter for this method. And then we just use it to instantly reset the rotation when this component gets disabled. So if we disable velocity-based rotation for whatever reason, we don't want to interpolate back to zero or anything like that. We just want to say that if we have a valid target and enable was set to false, then we just set the rotation back to zero, right? Instantly, like snap it back like that. And that's all we really need. It's 40 lines of code, but I get that lerp can be a bit confusing at first. So if you feel a bit lost, I definitely recommend reading the docs and watching the video and then coming back to this code, right? One final note, you can see that we use the lerp angle method here. So if we press and hold control and click on this, we get the docs for this method. So what do we have here? The only difference between lerp and lerp angle is that it makes sure that the angles wrap around when you come a full circle. So we have this value called tau, which is basically two times pi, right? Or in degrees, it equals to 360, so a full circle. So when you have a bigger value than the full circle, it automatically wraps around. So I don't know, 360 plus 20 would be 380, right? And this function changes it to 20 degrees, if you talk about degrees. I know it uses radians, but it's just easier to think about it like this. So basically the reason I use lerp angle here is because it makes sure that it wraps around. It doesn't really matter because it would be super weird for this velocity based rotation component to do a bigger rotation than a full circle, right? It would look really, really silly, but it's just safer to use it. And also the code looks a bit cleaner, I think. So yeah, that's it. Let me know in the comments if, if this was reasonable and you could understand what's happening here. I still definitely recommend checking out the other resources I mentioned. So if we save this script, now we just need to test it, right? So let's go back to 2D view and inside our unit scene, select the root node, the unit node, click on the plus sign or press Ctrl A and add a simple node like this. Double click and rename this to velocity based rotation. And all we need to do is to drag this script we just created and drop it over this node. And you can see that we have a bunch of export variables we defined in the script. The only one we really need to change here is the target, right? So what do we want to target? We don't actually want to rotate the whole unit. If we click on assign, it's much easier to just take the skin and rotate it. 
This way the collision shape will stay the same. We won't rotate the health bar and the mana bar, so I think it looks nicer if we only rotate the sprite 2D which holds the skin to the unit. So we click on OK. We can just save this unit scene with Ctrl S and if we run the game, we should have our rotation when we start dragging the units over and it instantly feels and looks much more satisfying than it was before. Even though this rotation value might be a bit crazy, this 120. So let's just change this back to something like 60. But you can experiment with the value, right? It looks much, much less crazy. Yeah. You can see that if I drag it slowly enough, then it won't really trigger the rotation. So we do really need that velocity in order to do this. I find it still a bit too pronounced. So let's just see 40. And we can also like set the lerp seconds if we want to, if we find it too slow or too quick. Yeah, now we're getting there. So I think this looks this looks a lot cooler. Yeah. I'm kind of happy with that. So we'll leave it at this. Right, but you can experiment with those values. One other thing we need to test is what happens if we disable this, right? So if we uncheck enable and run the game, you can see that the unit stops rotating altogether. So it works properly because if it's not enabled, we shouldn't be able to change the rotation no matter how fast I drag the unit. Awesome. So we can enable this again and we call this component done. So the final thing we do in this video is the outline highlighter component. And to achieve that effect, we'll use a shader. So if you go to assets and shaders, we have this 2D outline.gd shader. And I included the source for this shader. So this is from godoshaders.com. If you don't know this site, it's super useful because you have a bunch of shaders available for anyone and it uses Godot's shader language. So you don't have to translate it from, let's say, GLSL or another shading language. So we have this canvas group outline shader here and you can say that it adds an outer stroke to a canvas group and you can use shader parameters to set the thickness and the color of the outline. And the code is pretty simple. I don't really want to get into shaders because I'm not an expert in the topic by any means. I just wanted to use one that works fine for this use case. And I found this pretty simple. So a big shout out and credit to the author for making this shader for everyone. Okay, but what is a canvas group? We haven't used that node. So if we go to the docs page and look at the canvas group, it's a pretty simple node. And what it does is it merges several 2D nodes into a single draw operation. So what does that mean? It means that if you take a look at this example on the shader page, you have a bunch of separate sprite to these, right? For the body, head, arm, hand, legs, and so on. And if you put them into a canvas group, the engine itself will draw all these sprites as one, and you can treat it as one image, right? And this is super useful for shaders if you think about it, because it sort of combines all those different parts of that character, and you can apply the outline around the whole thing. Because if you think about it, otherwise it would be a bit strange, right? Like having to apply all the shaders to all the different sprites and you would have a couple of weird issues, right? Because if you were to apply the outline to all of those, let's say you have this outline here, but you might also have an outline at this part, right? Because that's the end of the hand. And you definitely don't want that. You want the outline to be just around the whole thing. So this is why this shader is used with a canvas group, because the canvas group merges them into one. In theory, we don't really need to use a canvas group here because we only have one sprite for the unit, but it's still the easiest way to do this. And it doesn't really cost us much performance in a small game like this to wrap the skin in a canvas group node. But we do have to do it because this shader only works with canvas groups. So first of all, let's select the unit, the root node, Press Ctrl A or click on the plus sign and search for canvas group. Let's press enter. You can double click and rename this to something like visuals, drag it to the top. And all we really need to do is to just drag and drop the skin inside to make sure that it's under our visuals canvas group. 
And you can see that we have a couple parameters we can tweak, but we don't really need to use any of those. What we can do, however, is we can click on the unit node, the root node, and click on this icon, group selected nodes. This is just to make sure that we can't really select and move around the children uh, accidentally. So I can only move the unit, but I can't really select the health bar or the skin or any of those other child nodes. So that's one thing. And we also need to attach the shader to the visuals, right? So let's click on the visuals, the canvas group, go to canvas item, material, and here we can use a shader material, but I already prepared this, so we can just drag and drop this to the outline shader. And if you click on it and go to shader parameters, here you can set the line color and line thickness. So if we start increasing this, you can see that the shader works perfectly as it outlines the whole character. But we don't really want this outline to be visible at all times, so we can just set the line thickness to zero for now. We actually want to change this from code, right? But we need to attach the material for this to work. So that's one thing. And now we can actually start creating the component. So let's collapse our assets folder in the file system, right-click on components, create a new script, and let's call this outline highlighter.gd. Click on create double click and open it up inside the editor. And this will be super, super simple compared to the velocity-based rotation. First of all, we'll provide a custom class name called Outline Highlighter. Then we'll have three export variables, one to the canvas group so we can have access to the shader, one for the outline color, and one for the thickness, which will be an integer between one and 10. And what we need to do inside the ready callback is we call visuals, which is a reference to the canvas group, that material, that set shader parameter. So we can use this to access shader parameters in canvas items, and we'll set the line color parameter to the outline color, which is an export variable for the color we want to use. So how do we know that line color is what you need to write here, you might ask. If we go back to 2D view for a second and click on the visuals node, if you go to material and click on the shader again, you can see that we have our shader parameters here, right? And if you hover over it, you'll see the property, right? So you have this line underscore color, and line underscore thickness. And so you can always check these if you hover over them, but you have access to them inside the code of the shader as well, right? It's the same thing. So let's go back to the script and we'll have two super simple methods. One is called clear highlight, which sets the line thickness to zero to sort of hide the highlight. And we have the counterpart of that, which is called highlight and it sets the line thickness parameter to the outline thickness we have as an export variable. And that's it, super, super simple component. Okay, so let's save this with control S and test it, right? So let's go back to 2D view. Again, we can reset the line thickness from 10 to zero. We need to select our root node, our unit node, click on the plus sign to add a new node. This will be a simple node, double click, rename this to outline highlighter, and just drag and drop the script over it. And we need to assign the visuals, so the canvas group node, which will be this one. We can set the outline color to whatever we like, I'll just use white. And for the outline thickness, we, we can test what works for us. I just used two for this example. So let's save the game with Control S and run to see what it looks like. And what happens? We instantly run into an error message. So what's going on here? We have an error inside our unit.gd script, inside our set stats method, and with this line of code, right? It says that invalid access to property or key region wrecked on a base object type of null instance. Hmm. So we cannot access this property because this is null for whatever reason. Okay, if we check our filter stack at the bottom, it checks out, right? Because we have this skin member, and it is actually null. So where do we have this? If we scroll up, it's an onReady variable to a sprite 2D, which uses its dollar notation inside our unit to access the skin. Oh, okay, so this is why we have this error, right? Because the skin is no longer just under the root node, the unit node, it's under the visuals, right? So we have an extra layer here. 
it's root node visuals and then the skin. So that's why we have this error message. If we stop the game from running and delete this skin, and if we press Ctrl space to have auto complete, we can scroll all the way down and we can see that in order to access the skin, we need to update this to visuals forward slash skin. And let me stop here for a second, just a food for thought. So a lot of people prefer using export variables instead of already references like these, especially for this reason, right? Because these links or these paths might break if we reorder things. And that's a completely valid argument, but like for a small scene like this, I see no point of changing this into an export variable, right? Because changing this into an export variable is useful when you want to have reference to siblings or other nodes from the scene tree, which are not directly your children. So if you want to access a child node, I either recommend using this version or one way to sort of protect yourself from breaking these paths is to use scene unique names, right? You remember. So if we were to right click on the skin and change it into a scene unique name, then we don't really have to bother with the whole path because we can just type in percent skin like this, right? This is a new addition to Godot 4, but a really welcome one. Again, for this one, I don't think it's necessary. So I just revoke the unique name because yeah, we changed it for the outline, but it's highly unlikely we need to change it again. And if we do, we'll just fix it, right? Because you can always learn from errors as well. Okay, tangent over. Now we can test this, right? So we fixed that broken reference and the game runs. We do have our velocity based rotation, but we don't really have outlines. Do you know why? When we go to the remote scene tree, we can take a look at our units. And the units are updated. So we do have this visuals canvas group. We do have the material with the shader attached to it. And we have the outline highlighter component. So what's causing this then? Well, if we go back to the outline highlighter script, we provided these two methods, right? We can clear the highlight and we can highlight that unit or the target we want to. See, the problem is we never call these, right? This is what's cool about component-based approaches. The outline highlighter itself isn't really concerned with the question of when do you want to highlight or clear the highlight of something. It doesn't care, right? It provides the functionality to do so, but the responsibility of when to do this will be the units. And the cool thing about this is, if you think about it, reusability, right? Because later on we'll have items in the game in Season 2. So we might want to outline items as well when you hover over them or something. Actually, highlighting or clearing the highlight will be the same process. We use the same shader, we set the color, we set the thickness, and we can either clear the highlight or show the highlight. But the circumstances might be different. And if we do this component and say that, okay, the component itself doesn't care about this, the circumstances, that makes it reusable. Because then we can just say that, okay, we'll provide the circumstances inside the unit's script and we'll say when we want to highlight or clear the highlight. We know that the component can actually handle setting the shader parameters. Hopefully that makes sense. It's a super cool and powerful way to think about systems and game development. So that's exactly what we do. If you don't have it open, you can just press Ctrl Alt O and search for unit.gd, but I do have it open here. And the first thing we want to do is to grab those new components we have. I'll make this editor smaller just to make sure we have access to our sync tree. And I already shown you this with the Slate Aspire clone series, but it's always good to reiterate. So let's select all of these components and if we drag them over to the script and press and hold control while we release the mouse, we'll have them dropped as already variables, which is pretty awesome. Now let's think about this for a second. So how do we want to connect these actions with each other? In terms of the outline highlighter, probably what makes the most sense is that when the mouse is hovered over the unit, we want to enable the highlights. And when the mouse leaves the unit's area, then we want to clear the highlight, right? So let's do this first. Let's go back to 2D view. And if we click on our root node, the unit node, and go to node and signals, fortunately for us, with collision object 2Ds, we have these two signals, mouse entered and mouse exited. So let's double click on mouse entered, connect it to our unit method, and we should have this new method just here. 
double click on mouse exit it and do the same. Awesome. So the first thing we want to do is when the mouse enters the unit, we want to call the outline highlighter components highlight method. And we can set the Z index to a bigger value just to make sure that it renders on top of the other units, for example, if they overlap each other. This might not be strictly necessary because later on in our game, units can't really overlap each other, but still, it might be useful for now, at least for testing purposes. And similarly to this, when the mouse exits the unit's area, we want to call the outline highlighters clear highlight method and set the Z index back to zero. So now if we save this, script with control s and run the game again we should have the outline highlighter component working right but we do have a problem or i don't know if it's a problem strictly speaking it really depends on how you want to do this in your game so when i start dragging i don't really want to highlight the unit anymore especially because if i you can see that if i drag it too fast the outline disappears and reappears if I'm too fast and it looks a bit jarring and weird. And also if I drag a unit, I can hover over another one and it highlights as well. So I kind of only want to do this highlight thing if the unit I'm dragging over is not currently a unit that's being dragged, right? So how can we do this? Well, it's pretty simple, because if we scroll all the way up, we do have access to our drag and drop component, right? And if we press and hold control and click on it from the last episode, we do have this member variable called dragging, which keeps track of whether the unit is currently being dragged or not. So we can just always check this. So if we go back to our unit script, we can do something like this. When the mouse enters, the unit's area, we check if the drag and drop component's dragging property is true. If it's true, then we can return from this function immediately and we don't want to do any of the highlighting or any of the clearing highlight either. So this way we provided a safeguard to only do this when the unit is not being dragged. So if we save this with Control S and run the game again, you can see that the highlighting thing works but if I start dragging the unit, the highlight stays on. And if I move it fast enough, now it won't break this highlight because no matter if I leave it, this on mouse exited won't be executed, right? Because it's being dragged. The problem is it didn't really clear the highlight, right? It stays on no matter how fast I do it. Depending what you want with your game, we can fix this. But we also have to deal with the velocity-based rotation, right? Because um, we don't really do anything when the dragging starts or the dragging ends. Why is that a problem? Well, because when the dragging ends, we don't really want to enable the velocity-based rotation. Because down the line, it could lead to very interesting behavior when the fight goes on, right, in season two time, the unit will move. So the velocity will be calculated and it would be super weird if the unit is not being dragged but still rotates around like crazy during battle. We don't want that to happen. So we need to deal with the drag and drop events as well. So if we go back to the drag and drop script, we do have a couple of signals, right? When the drag starts or when the drag is cancelled or when the unit is dropped. So we can connect to those signals. And what we'll do is we'll, inside the ready callback, we'll connect to those signals. And you'll see an interesting if statement here. If not engine.isEditor hint. What on earth is that? So you might remember from the previous episode that we made this a tool script. And what a tool script does is it runs the code inside the editor as well. So we needed this because if we want to change the skin, we want it to be reflected inside the editor when we change it too. So not all units look the same. See, the problem is then all the code will be run inside the editor. And we don't really want to handle anything drag and drop related inside the editor. So we just make the check. Is editor hint will be true if we are inside the editor and will be false if we actually play the game. 
So it's sort of just a safeguard to say that, okay, this code only needs to execute when we actually run the game. Now we have the errors because we haven't implemented those methods yet. Okay, so what do we want to do when the drag starts? It will be pretty simple, actually. We'll provide this method called on drag started and we'll enable the velocity based rotation component. Because when we start dragging a unit, we want it to rotate, right? What about when the dragging is cancelled? Well, when the dragging is cancelled, we want to disable the velocity based rotation and we want the unit to reset to its original position. So when the dragging is cancelled, we do have the starting position as a vector too, because this is handled by the drag and drop component. If we go back there for a second, you can see when the drag is cancelled, we return back the starting position. So we can do whatever we want to do in this case. So for the unit, we can just reset after dragging. And the reason why I want to call a method here is because later down the line, we actually want to reset not just when the dragging is cancelled. So there will be other use cases for the unit to reset after dragging. And that's why I provided a public function for this, which of course we are yet to implement. But it will be pretty basic. Two things need to be done there. We disable the velocity based rotation and we set the global position back to that starting position when we cancel the dragging. So again, this is just called here now. So we could, could have easily just inserted to those two lines of code there. But this is just to sort of peek into the future because we might need to use this elsewhere too. So now if we save this and play the game once more, you'll see that, okay, the outline highlighter works. I can rotate the unit around and I can sort of let go of the unit. But if I start dragging and press right click, you'll see that reset works as well. It goes back to the starting position, turns off the outline highlight, and everything looks fine. Now, the last thing we might want to do, I don't know how you want this to work in your game, but if you don't want this outline to last while you're dragging the unit, I kind of like it how it is now, but I'll show you just in case you want it to work differently. What we can do is when we start the dragging, we can just call outline highlighter dot clear highlight like this, right? And if we do this and start dragging the unit, it immediately clears the highlight, right? And I can still drag over the other units and they will be highlighted, but this won't because no matter if the mouse is over it, this component is disabled while it's being dragged. Okay, so I don't know which version you want. I uh, just delete this for now because I changed my mind and I kind of like it still being outlined while the dragging happens like this. Okay, so I think we're done with the two new components. We learned a bunch. We fixed a few bugs as well. And that's it for this video. I guess I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.